Good morning, dear friends. I'm Dr. Shabir. I'm a consultant neurologist in Ikra Hospital, Kodikur. At the outset, I would like to thank the organizers, Anunav Patanandita and Anunav Kerala, for giving me this opportunity. I welcome all the delegates to this CNE, and I wish all, all of you to have a wonderful learning experience. As all of you are aware, Perinatal asphyxia is a global problem and it is a major contributor fac contributing factor for neonatal mortality as well as morbidity and it's a significant problem for neonatal mortality in our country. So today we'll discuss care of an asphyxiated newborn in NICU. By definition, parental asphyxia refers to a condition during the first and second stage of labor in which there is impaired gas exchange, which leads to fetal acidosis, hypoxemia, and hypercarbia. Fetal acidosis is defined by a umbilical arterial pH less than 7. And the term asphyxia should be strictly reserved to a condition in which you have enough data from prenatal, perinatal, and postnatal history to support its diagnosis without any doubt. In ambiguous situations, you should avoid labeling the baby as asphyxiated. Perinatal depression is another cl clinical descriptive term that pertains to the condition of the infant in the first hour of birth with depressed mental status, hypotonia, and with or without disturbances in spontaneous respiration and cardiovascular function. So, baby who is asphyxiated will be perinatally depressed, but all perinatally depressed babies are need not be asphyxiated. There are other reasons for perinatal depressions apart from perinatal asphyxia, such as maternal drugs, general anesthesia, etc. So, both these terms should be used appropriately. Neutral encephalopathy is a clinical condition that describes an abnormal neurobehavioral state consisting of an altered level of consciousness and usually with other signs of brainstem and motor dysfunction. So it also have multiple etiologies and HIE or hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy is one of the type of or one of the reason for neutral encephalopathy is hypoxia, hypoxic ischemic damage. So all neutral encephalopathies are not HIEs and only when you have clinical evidence of encephalopathy with objective da data to support a hypoxic ischemic mechanism as underlying cause for encephalopathy, then only you should label it as hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. So all these terms should be used in appropriate sense. Hypoxic ischemic brain injury is a neuropathologic term that describes neuropathology, which is attributable to a hypoxic ischemic mechanism as evidenced by neuroimaging. So coming to the diagnosis of perinatal asphyxia, it's essentially a clinical diagnosis, which needs a appropriate, which should have appropriate prenatal history to support with appropriate prenatal history as well as postnatal history. And the lab diagnosis, lab tests also help in establishing a diagnosis of prenatal asphyxia. The prenatal history should include maternal risk factors and prenatal history should comprise fetal heart rate tracing, the, uh, details of ultrasound examinations and biophysical profiles just prior to the delivery, if it is available, any sepsis risk factors, cord blood gas with cord blood pH, any history of sentinel events, the UPGAS scores, the resuscitative efforts, and immediate postnatal blood gas, blood gas whenever it is available. The postnatal neurological examination, whether there is any dysmorphism or not, whether baby developed any seizures in the first few hours of life, 
and the evidence of other organ damage such as oliguria cardio respiratory dysfunction need for inotropic support pressure process uh, vasopressor support ventilator support all these things should be properly documented in any case of asphyxia the lab tests such as arterial blood gas serum electrolytes lft rft complete blood count coagulation profile cardiac markers such as trop t trop i etc will help in establishing a diagnosis of parental asphyxia similarly eeg is also important in detecting seizures sometimes the seizures may may not have a may not be able to detect clinically you may might see a seizures only in the eeg so eeg is also helpful in case of parental asphyxia coming to the etiology of parental asphyxia the etiology is quite variable and it can be due to maternal factors placental factors uterine factors cord accidents fetal factors such as anemia or high drops even neonatal factors such as congenital critical congenital heart disease pph and mas and pneumothorax can co can contribute to perinatal hypoxic ischemic damage coming to the management of perinatal asphyxia it includes the preventive prevention and early recognition of perinatal asphyxia as well as stabilization of if an asphyxiated baby control of seizures and therapeutic hypothermia as well so we'll come to these aspects one by one the prevention of perinatal hypoxic ischemic injury includes proper antepartum assessment and identification of the high risk pregnancy so all high risk pregnancies should ideally should have an Come uh, to uh, continuous electronic fetal heart rate monitoring to detect any fetal compromise at the earliest possible uh, point, and fetal scalp pH monitoring is another strategy which also helps to detect fetal acidemia sufficiently early. So whenever it is available, we can use it. The close monitoring of progress of labor is. very important in all cases of in all deliveries and any deviation from the normal and ideally a partogram is essential to detect any abnormal progress of labor which is which is likely to go for perinatal asphyxia so whenever there is any deviation from the normal or whenever the uh, uh, and if it will uh, the distress is documented the prenatal team should be alert should should get alerted for appropriate management if there is any evidence of fetal distress the prenatal hypoxic ischemic injury can be recognized with this clues and optimal resuscitation and stabilization of the infant should be done as per napier guidelines to minimize the further damage so any baby who is depressed birth should have a cord blood gas to detect the fetal acidemia always try to avoid hyperthermia at the time of resuscitation and once the resuscitation is over allow passive cooling until a decision for therapeutic hypothermia is made so when, during passive cooling you can switch off the radiant warmer and you can either continuously monitor the active temperature or you can intermittently check the axillary temperature to keep them to uh, to prevent the baby going further down into severe hypothermia systemic serial neurological examination with a standard neurological scoring system is important to detect the eligibility for therapeutic hypothermia and consider using eeg or amplitude and degree eeg according to the availability of such facility so that help in detecting seizures as well as that helps in prognostication so stabilization of systemic physiology of 
at most importance to prevent further neurological damage. So temperature should be controlled within the normal range initially and you should avoid hyperthermia and even passive cooling to a moderate level that is 33 to 34 degree celsius can be initiated as early as possible and once the decision for therapeutic hypothermia is made we can sh shift the baby to the cooling therapy and during ventilation the carbon dioxide should be maintained in a normal should be maintained in a normal range that is ideally between 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury both hypercap hyper uh, capnia as well as hypocapnia will further damage the brain. So that should be avoided. The hypercapnia will lead to excessive cerebral vasodilatation and that can predispose the ischemic brain to undergo hemorrhagic trans transformation. And hypocapnia may, may further reduce the cerebral blood flow and that might accentuate the hypoxic brain damage. So both should be avoided. Similarly, Oxygenation should be maintained within the normal range. So ideally, the oxygen sa saturation target should be between 90 to 95 for preterm baby and just above 95 for a term baby. As with carbon dioxide, both hypo hypoxemia as well as hyperoxemia or hyperoxia are detrimental to the hypoxic brain. So that should be prevented. Similarly, the perfusion should also be maintained in the normal range. Hyperperfusion as well as hyperperfusion should be avoided. BP should be maintained in the normal range. The judicious use of volume expanders, inotropes, and vasopressors should be used whenever necessary. And avoid systemic hypotension and hypertension because that might cause hemorrhage complications. Similarly, the metabolic milieu of the body also should be maintained in a normal range. Hypocalcemia is, is common in HIE. It can cause seizures per se or it can accentuate cardiac dysfunction. So that should be checked. And whenever it is found abnormal, that should be corrected. Similarly, the glucose levels also should be maintained in the normal range. Ideally, it should be maintained between 50 to 100 milligram per deciliter. The hypoglycemia will exacerbate neurological injury or it can cause seizures per se. Similarly, hyperglycemia can increase brain lactate level and it can accentuate cerebral edema or it can predispose the baby to develop a intracranial bleed. So that should be maintained within the normal range. That is 50 to 100 milligram per deciliter. So that should be periodically checked and when it's, whenever it is found abnormal, that has to be corrected as early as possible. Similarly, hyponatremia, that is low serum sodium, also can be seen as part of perinatal asphyxia. It can occur as due to excessive volume overload or as part of syndrome of you know, inappropriate ADH secretion. This hyponatremia may also worsen the already existing neurologic damage. So that also has to be actively looked for and should be managed accordingly. The judicious management of fluid is also very essential for optimal outcome. Both fluid overload as well as inadequate circulating volume should be avoided. The common reasons for uh, abnormal flu uh, fluid status is acute tubular necrosis of kidney or syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, which is bo which both can occur as a complication of parental asphyxia. So in su such situation, there should be a tight regulation of the fluid administered and there should be a proper documentation of the intake and output chart. So mild fluid restriction may be helpful in asphyxia by, by reducing cerebral edema. So daily weight checks, urine output, serum electrolytes ex estimation may help in better fluid management. Seizure control is also essential for preventing further neurological damage. So seizures usually starts within 12 hours, usually increase in frequency and usually resolve within a few days. So sometimes it can be very difficult to control and 
at times it may be even subclinical so, the, so that you might not miss the seizures if you only rely on clinical methods so the the there comes the importance of eeg or amplitude integrated eeg which can detect electrographic seizures so that also has the potential to cause neurology further neurologic damage so sometimes the seizures may be may not have a motor component it may manifest only with abrupt changes in, changes in bp heart rate and oxygenation so proper documentation of these events and close attention of all these vital parameters is of paramount important to detect for de for detecting seizures appropriately so for seizure control phenobarbitone is the first line drug the preferred drug followed by phenytoin or phosphonytoin and for benzodiazepines or levetiracetam can be added as a third line agent whenever seizures are not controlled with the first two drugs so usually the anti epileptic drugs are will be weaned as early as possible and usually the weaning happens in the reverse order the the drug which is started last should be withdrawn first and long term anti epileptic drugs are not generally required and only when there is a persistent neurologic abnormality or persistent epileptiform discharges in the eeg then only long term anti epileptic treatment is warranted following hi as you are aware the hi does not affect nor asphyxia uh, uh, doesn't uh, does not affect only the brain but it can cause other organ damage so you should pay attention to the other organ systems also the cardiac dysfunction is very common the whenever there is cardiac infection in cardiac dysfunction you should pay attention to correction of hypoxia acidosis hypocalcemia and hypoglycemia all these can worsen the the asphyxial cardiac damage so all those things should be corrected as early as possible and judicious fluid management is also essential for improving the cardiac dysfunction so monitor the heart rate blood pressure and urine output should be regularly monitored and when we indicated the uh, the inotropes or vasopressors can be administered whenever there is hypotension dopamine dobutamine and melatonin are the preferred agents in case of asphyxial myocardial injury similarly the renal dysfunction is also very common following asphyxial injury proper monitoring of urine output with electrolytes and urine analysis is important in case of oliguria avoid fluid overload by limiting free water administration low dose dopamine might be helpful in improving the renal ischemia if baby is not already volume overload overloaded a fluid challenge with 10 to 20 ml of uh, per kg of normal saline with a single dose of uh, loop diuretic may be helpful in opening up the kidneys in case of uh, oliguria similarly asphyxial gastrointestinal damage is also common the babies who are asphyxiated are at risk for developing nec so generally we avoid feeding until bp is stable and active bowel sounds are audible and whenever the uh, stools are having blood it's better to avoid feeding so once as the stool is negative for blood we can start giving feeds So whenever you start feeds you should always monitor for development of any signs of nec hematologic system as well as uh, liver also will get affected with uh, asphyxia so monitoring of lft coagulation profile fibrinogen and platelet are warranted in moderate to severe case of asphyxia sometimes the uh, coagulation dis dysfunction may require ffp or cryo precipitate transfusion and uh, when, whenever there is evidence of dic the even the platelet transfusion may be required and in case of liver dysfunction you may have to pay attention to the drugs which you administer the drug levels may the drug metabolism can be affected severely and drug levels can go high so such drugs need to be monitored 
when there is a severe liver dysfunction. Coming to take home messages, the parental asphyxia is a significant contributor to the neonatal mortality and morbidity. And is, it is, even though it is uh, not always preventable, early recognition and appropriate interventions will result in better outcomes. Initial stabilization and optimal supportive care reduces the damage and therapeutic hypothermia when indicated results in better neurodevelopmental outcome. So it has to be initiated whenever it is indicated. Thank you.